Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Attention ranchers, transform your land, livestock, and livelihood with Noble Research's regenerative management courses. Learn from their expert advisors and unlock proven strategies to enhance soil health, improve forage quality, reduce operation costs, and increase profitability. Through hands-on workshops, you'll gain skills to build a resilient and thriving ranch for generations to come. Space is limited. Visit noble.org today to explore their regenerative management courses and enroll. Invest today in your land, livestock, and and livelihood. That link is also in the show notes. Hey, hey, folks, welcome back to another podcast episode. It's Shay here. And for the duration of April, we are really going to be focusing on regenerative practices for ranching and how to determine which practices are beneficial to your operation and qualify as being regenerative. So to kick off this series, I had a very refreshing conversation with Caitlin Word about why regenerative practices are such a hot topic and really what that definition of regenerative means and what it really means for us as cattle producers in general. And yeah, I am really excited to share it with you guys. Also, if you want to learn more about maybe some of the misinformation or myths or misconceptions about regenerative practices, head to the Facebook page, Casual Cattle Conversations. And Caitlin and I also went live there just because we had so much information to share. So before we dive in today, I do want to remind that any of you aspiring podcasters out there, if you are ready to commit to your dream and desire to start your own podcast, the Kickstart Your Podcast Workbook is in stock. And if you want to dive in and get started today, send me a message on my website and I'll be in touch about how you can access that workbook and launch your podcast within a month to six weeks if you're really committed to it. So with that, Let's visit with Caitlin and kick off this fun series. All right, Caitlin. Well, it is a pleasure to have you on the show today and you get to kick off this regenerative series that is happening over the month of April. And I'm excited to visit with you about why regenerative ranching is such a hot topic, as well as kind of some beginning steps for for producers who are interested in maybe diving a little deeper and maybe implementing some of those practices. Um, So to start off, you know, I was reading through the bio you sent me when you scheduled your time to interview, and you have an extensive background in cattle production. And I guess I'd like to learn a little bit more about why you are passionate about the grazing component of cattle production. Yeah, well, first off, thanks for having me, Shay. I'm honored to uh, kick off this series. I'm glad you're doing it. Um, The more voice that we can give to the topic, the better. Um, To answer your question... So why am I kind of passionate about the grazing part of cattle production? Um, to me, that question is almost like, you really love living. So tell me why you're passionate about air. <laughs> you know, I feel like you just, it's the foundation of everything to do with 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 cattle production. So our great, or even more than cattle production, our grazing lands are the foundation of everything whenever you want to get down to the root of it. No pun intended. Um, but... I guess, you know, I have formal education in like ruminant nutrition. I did, you know, some feedlot nutrition training and things like that. I did um, some master's work with dairy cattle. So I have an extensive background kind of in the industry of cattle feeding and cattle production, right? And something about all of it always didn't really sit well with me. Um, I just always felt like there was a little bit more there's a piece that we were missing whenever it came to my formal education I felt like there was a piece I was missing and I didn't want to go necessarily into range whenever I was in college I was really interested in the in the animal production side of it but it was always strange to me how they're very segregated so if you get a formal education if you go get a master's degree I mean for me in my building the animal science grad students and, you know, classes are on one, one level of the building and ranges on a different, a completely different floor. And, um, I feel like that's a really great, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly how it is in, in, in real life in the world for a lot of the industry and the way it has been is grazing and range has been very segregated from the production side of things. And it's never made sense to me 
um, because I grew up on, on cow calf operations and I grew up ranching and I see the connection and it makes sense in my brain. <laughs> and so whenever I came to Noble, um, I was able to be around a lot of really crazy, intelligent people um, from all walks of life and all different kind of disciplines. And so whenever I got to sit with the the range experts and the grazing lands experts, um, and I took what I knew in my technical foundation in nutrition and in cattle production, and then I began to understand more about the grazing side of it, it just, it just clicked. It just made sense because you just, you can't have one without the other. And in order for cattle production to exist and exist well, um, and be fruitful, you have to make that connection between the two. And I, I think, you know, the reason why we're talking about this topic today, the reason why regenerative ag and regenerative grazing is becoming a hot button topic because more and more people are making that connection and seeing the viability. Yeah. So what is your role with Noble? So I am a regenerative ranching advisor at Noble. So, um, and I, I hired on in the livestock kind of specialty area, and we've drifted away from having specialties. Um, and we're all kind of more generalists now in the regenerative space. But um, I hired on the, in the livestock grazing space, and that's still kind of my my specific area of interest. So then do you get to work directly with um, livestock producers or grazers or however yeah. you want to refer to yeah, them? Yeah, I spent a lot of time being boots on the ground, um, going to operations and and um, speaking and and doing a lot of those those types of things. But yes, I interact one on one with producers, answering their questions um, and and trying to help them, you know, better manage their their operations and their herds. Awesome. So you already touched on it a little bit, but it seems like any podcast you listen to or publication you pull up or any article, social media post, regenerative ranching or regenerative practices. That's a very big <laughs> buzzword in a sense. And yeah, it's everywhere. <laughs> I I guess why can you dive more into why that is such that hot topic or buzzword in agriculture right now? Yeah, I think Shay, it really comes down to kind of the marketing cycle, right? Um, we've had we had the era of holistic. Holistic was, you know, a big buzzword for a while. And then we entered into sustainability and sustainable was a big buzzword for a while. And now we're into regenerative. Um, and they've really essentially all been talking about the same thing. And you can get into the nitty gritty of definitions and everyone's going to have a different, de different definition of sustainability and holistic and regenerative. And what does all this mean? Right. But I think everyone's just trying to get down to the same the, to the same root of the problem um, or of the conversation, which is just, we're trying to make the connection between the way ecology was exists and the way it functions and um, the way our ecological communities were always meant to function and trying to create a synergy between that and the production side of it and the, and the way that we can make a, a livelihood, right? And I think those words have always just been an attempt at, at marketing that connection and I mean, and I, I say that I don't mean anything negative by it being, being a marketing play or anything like that, because I think regenerative is the best word that we have found for it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it it best defines what it is we're trying to achieve and and the outcomes that that we're after. Um, but as far as it being everywhere right now, I think, you know, the, the general public kind of will glum on to certain words or like I say glum on to them, they'll, they'll um, resonate with them so they can relate to certain things or you know, the word regenerate means to create life, to generate life, right? And so people really love the idea of that. And so now that word's everywhere. And whatever we can do to to draw the general public's eye to what we're doing and, and towards uh, what this word means is great. So, but I think that's why we're seeing it everywhere is it's it's certainly an attractant. <clears throat> I, I agree that it is probably one of the better words that is out there. I mean, because like you said, you know, it was, there's holistic, there's sustainability. Those all mean a lot. There's conservation is a different one that yeah. is different, but sometimes gets used almost interchangeably. Right. It, maybe talk a little bit about that, how the conservation and regenerative maybe practices or the terms by definition are slightly different. 
Yeah. So, and, and you hear the term regenerative practices a lot and I'll, I'll say that's something that like, I'm not sure exists. Um, to me, like regenerative agriculture and regeneration in general, it's based on principles. Um, and so a regenerative practice doesn't necessarily exist because there aren't practices that are re regenerative, right? Regeneration is an outcome that we're trying to achieve. And so how do we achieve that outcome? And there's lots of different ways to do that, but it's kind of in the way that you apply whatever practice it is. Um, because any given practice can achieve a regenerative outcome or it could degenerate the same practice um, on different uh, on different operations in different uh, climates, in different states, different rainfall areas. And so, you know, I try to keep that in mind that it's, it's, it's a lot, I say it's simpler, it's more complex than just practices. It's, it's how do you apply principles and conservation is the same way in that it's trying to achieve an outcome. Um, conservation is a little bit different because, you know, it's the word conserve, right? So a lot of that, and you'll hear that a lot with like wildlife conservation specifically. And so a lot of, a lot of what you hear about conservation will um, apply to wildlife um, and, or conservation easements, right? And and they're things that we're trying to to conserve. So we're trying to keep them from something. If you think about the word conserve, what does that mean? Um, and then to regenerate is we're trying to bring it back. <laughs> so we're trying to create life. We're trying to move forward. So con conservation, and then also I think about sustainability. The word sustainability in the same way. We're just trying to hold steady. We're trying to not go backwards. Um, and to stay where we are. That's kind of what sustainability means to me. And so that's why the word regenerative and why I feel like it resonates with a lot of people, it has kind of an action into it, right? It's like an action word, an action statement. We're going to regenerate. We're going to bring something back to life rather than just try to keep it somewhere and hold it steady. Not that that's what conservation is, but the word inherently, I feel like when we hear it, we we have that association. Thank you for explaining that and even throwing sustainability in there too because also with sustainability I think we get caught up in some of the greenwashing that happens and forget yeah. that there are the three pillars of sustainability and that profitability is in there as well and yeah absolutely so but back onto like the regenerative standpoint too so you talked about you know there are practices that can be used to regenerate the soil Mm -hmm. or bring or whatever it may be you're bringing it back to life or improving it more than anything is the focus what are some simple questions or maybe metrics producers can look at to determine if their current practices on their operation are regenerating their soils maybe just maintaining or degrading them yeah that's a really great question um i think first a producer has to anybody has to understand what goal that they're that they're after right so what does a healthy ecological system look like um what does regeneration look like and that's an answer that, or that's a question that i don't know if we can answer like in our lifetime right because what we're trying to achieve is we're trying to bring things back we're trying to bring them back to um, a, a level of, of health and of productivity and of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, of resilience, right, that existed before we went and kind of beat it out of the land. We, we minded of that resilience. And so we're trying to get that back. And in my lifetime, we'll never see it back the way that it was. Um, most rangelands, we just see these, these things take hundreds of years to degrade and hundreds of years to bring back. Um, but understanding what a healthy ecological system looks like, looks like and what those healthy cycles look like and how to identify symptoms of when they're broken versus when they're functioning well, those are the things that you need to, you know, look for. And, you know, I could sit here and give you a list of, of, of symptoms of these different cycles, um, that probably is going to take more time than we have, but there's lots of resources available, um, for someone to be able to to learn that and understand that. But you want to look at things like, do I have erosion on my land? What are my uh, plant communities look like? Do I have diversity? Um, do I have soil cover? Am I able to, to cover the soil to prevent erosion? Um, do I have residual forage at the end of a grazing event? If not, why? And um, why do I want that? So understanding a lot of these, I guess, kind of checkpoints where you can check yourself 
to to understand what is happening on the land because whenever you look at whenever you look at what you can see above ground all of that is telling you what's going on below ground um and the soil is 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 what's feeding everything. It is it, it is the life of the land. And so in order to understand what's going on below, we have to understand what it's telling us um, and it communicates above ground. And so understanding what a healthy system looks like. And again, there's there's some resources and things like that um, to, to be able to help, help, I guess, kind of check yourself. Um, but there's there's you could do grazing exposures, you could do photo points um, to be able to you know see what things look like a year ago versus now. There's lots of different ways to do that, but it's hard to just um, in you know in a few words say what somebody should look at other than understand what a healthy ecological system and a healthy ecological cycles look like, and then you can take a look at your land. And um, over time, see, am I improving or are things going backwards? Like, do things look look the way they should or am I having to, to prop the land up? Am I having to prop this system up? Um, because if I am, something's broken. And we will go through towards the end of the podcast. I'll ask for what some of those resources are and we can share that as well and put those in the show notes. But before we get to that point, so I know right away when I first started hearing and learning or the regenerative practices or regenerative ranching became more of a buzzword and I started hearing mm -hmm. and learning more about it. It almost seemed like a lot was thrown out there. It was a lot to digest and consume and yeah. it all felt like they were very intense and big changes yeah. and like, how could that even be possible? What can you share about, you know, do practices that are regenerating the soil, do they have to be super intense? Are they maybe things that, you know, when you work with producers, are they a lot of things that they're already doing, but just need slight tweaking? Like what can that look like? Yeah, I get that question a lot. And I think, you know, a lot of people wonder the same thing. Um, and I think you do, because you hear a lot of the big success stories and you hear things like, you think of, of Alan Savory's pitch back um, you know, decades ago, whenever he was saying, you know, oh, you can double your stocking rate. And that's what people heard, double your stocking rate. They hear these, these giant success stories and um, how you get there and what you do to get there. They kind of miss that piece. Or I move my animals four to five, six times a day. You think of like Birdwell Clark. Um, and people go, wow, that's super intense. I can never do that. But the reason why they're doing that and the outcomes that they're achieving and why that works for them within their context is the piece that, 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 that can be missing, right? So we're trying to sell these success stories, but then there's all this background information that gets lost. <clears throat> and I think that's probably why that happens for a lot of people. Um, but to answer your question, no, it does not have to be super intense or super time consuming. And, and on the contrary, there are a lot of producers um, and even some of our ranchers for Noble who will tell you that they didn't lose any time. Their time is just spent differently. A lot of producers who make the switch from so-called conventional agriculture to regenerative ranching, regenerative grazing will tell you that two years ago, the time that I spent on the tractor, now I spend in, in my herd. Now I spend moving fences. Now, you know, the time that I spent baling hay or putting out hay or putting out fertilizer, none of those things are bad inherently, but the time that they spent doing those things, now they spend moving fence or moving animals or moving water, right? So um, not to say that they're, they're, I think there's a switch in what you spend your time doing. I wouldn't say it's more time intensive. Um, I just think you spend your time doing different things and, and, and I hear that a lot. That's, you know, validated by a lot of feedback that I have heard and, and that some of my um, colleagues have heard as well. But you also, you can take baby steps. I mean, if you do any of this cold turkey or, you know, just completely jump off the deep end, there's a learning curve to anything and to anything you change and any new practices that you adopt and, and any switch in management. And so, you know, those learning curves, if you take all of them all at once, you might crash. And so, you know, kind of make, making small steps and figuring out what works for you versus what doesn't, what you do have the time for or, you know, the bandwidth for, you know, it's going to be a little bit different for everybody. But it absolutely does not have to be all in, all consuming, super intense, 
Um, a lot of the times I think it takes a lot of things off of your plate and can simplify your focus. Attention ranchers, transform your land, livestock, and livelihood with Noble Research's regenerative management courses. Learn from their expert advisors and unlock proven strategies to enhance soil health, improve forage quality, reduce operation costs, and increase profitability. Through hands-on workshops, you'll gain skills to build a resilient and thriving ranch for generations to come. Space is limited. Visit noble.org today to explore their regenerative management courses and enroll. Invest today in your land, livestock, and livelihood. That link is also in the show notes. So that being said, do you see so, so many producers are diversified right now, yeah. whether it's cattle and crops or, um, you know, maybe they're cow-calf and they're running stalkers, or maybe they do have multiple livestock species or have a job in town to, along with their cattle. Yeah. Do you see a lot of people making the changes to fit their current business model or when people start diving in are they completely changing their business model once they kind of get into the more uh, or focusing more on regenerating their resources yeah that's a really great question too i think you'll have a little bit of both um but i also think it, it comes back to what your motivating factor is so if your motivating factor is, so for example, if someone um, is wanting to get into direct to consumer marketing, right? So obviously, you know, that is going to drive the back end change on their operation um, because you're, you're trying to drive to meet what, you know, the public's asking for and what your client is asking for. Um, but there are also people who have a certain business model and they start saying, okay, this isn't working for me and on the production side. Um, so my day-to-day -day isn't working. My grazing isn't working. And they, they kind of get curious. They hear something, they go to a conference, they hear a talk, they hear a podcast and they get curious about it. Right. And so whenever things start to change on the production side, I, I feel like it's really difficult for it to change in one place. So it's like on the production side and not on the business side, it's difficult to segregate the two. And a lot of the times one will change first and then drive the other. Um, but I think it'd be difficult for a business model to completely stay stagnant if your production model is changing because it's a, it's a mindset. So I think that's what I'm getting at Shay is that like the, the regenerative agriculture, you know, movement, it's really just a mindset shift more than it is, you know, a, a, a marriage to practices or, or anything like that. And so when people's mindset change and you start to look at things differently and you start to gauge your success differently, your definition of success changes um, and the outcomes that you're seeking and, and what it means to achieve those, those change for you. And so when your mindset changes there, I think your mindset about your business model and about what you're trying to achieve there also changes. And so a lot of the times, you do see just kind of this this gradual change happening all throughout the operation. Um, but it doesn't have to, and it does, certainly doesn't have to happen on the front end. I appreciate you talking about that. And I know that's something that I think about and talk about a lot on the cattle side. And my husband does a lot of agronomy work, and we talk about how there's so many different ways for producers to do things, even within even if they're farming or ranching within the same area and still yeah. be successful. And I think that's one of the great things about agriculture is how much autonomy we have to create the businesses we want and have our own unique goals for our operations. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, what are some of the beginning steps that are maybe a little easier for producers to introduce so that they aren't making all those changes and hitting that crash that you talked about before? Yeah, um, so there's lots of different ways to do it, and it depends on what the operation is and what enterprises they have and things like that, right? But um, you can always, you know, and you can you can look these up. There's, you know, like the six soil health principles. Um, Noble has those listed on our website. You can just Google six soil health principles, and they come up all over the place, right? But you can take a look at those and see, okay, what are ways I can integrate those? So, you know, for example, one of them is, is cover my soil. Another is maintain uh, um, continuous living roots in the ground. Um, another one is increased diversity. And so it's like, what are some ways that I can do some of those things? And am I doing them? And what are ways that I'm keep, keeping them from happening? Um, one of the principles is, is to minimize disturbance. So unnatural disturbance. And so that is any kind of disturbance 
to, you know, that, that wouldn't have naturally happened. And so you think about, um, you think about mowing, you think about fertilizing, you think about spraying, and it's not that any of those things are bad. We're not saying eradicate it, right? But we want to reduce it. We want to optimize, minimize um, that kind of disturbance. So you can take a look at those principles and start thinking, are these things happening and why are they not? Um, and what can I do to help them? Because all of those principles, what they are is, is they're, they're creating, you know, a fruitful, you know, healthy ecological system. Um, and that's a really good, great way to just kind of get started and, and, and to, to gauge yourself and, and see where you're at. So with that, what are some of the resources? I mean, you mentioned, mentioned the six soil health principles. What are some other resources cattle producers can lean to to learn more about how they can begin improving their natural resources? Yeah, um, well, I'll say so, you know, I'm at Noble Research Institute and we have um, a newsletter that goes out every week called Noble Rancher and there's some really great resources in there and we also share resources um, from all different, you know, other areas and partners and, and it, different organizations that have really cool articles out or success stories. And so that's in there. So Noble Rancher, you can sign up for that. Um, and all these, you know, articles and resources, we have those every week. And so a lot of it is testimonials from different ranchers, from our own ranchers, um, about, you know, things that they're learning and experiencing. And so I feel like that's a good place to get started. Um, any way that you can network and connect with ranchers and peers around you. And a lot of the times it's just starting the conversation, just having the conversation. You'll find out that there's a lot of people around you that are either engaging um, with, you know, with, with, with even other producers, but engaging in kind of this regenerative movement. And um, I hate calling it a movement because the thing is, is that, I mean, it's been around forever. Like I, I said, you know, regeneration, you know, it is a, a, a buzzword, but what is happening, a lot of people have been doing for a long time. Um, it's just really catching on and, and catching, you know, media attention now, but um, I digress. Um, on the website, there's lots of resources. We do have some courses as well that are available. So for example, there's um, a course that we offer called Noble Land Essentials, and it's a two-day course. And what that course is, is helping you understand what does a healthy ecosystem look like? What does healthy rangeland look like? What are these soil health principles? What do they mean? Why do we care about them? Um, and how can you gauge them from an observational standpoint? What are some of those metrics that you can look at? Um, some things like that. So I would encourage you to, you know, and if you look up regenerative grazing, regenerative agriculture, I mean, you'll get so many hits. Um, but there's lots of different organizations. There's the National um, yeah, National Grazing Land Coalition and there's some state grazing land coalitions and they all, all have really great resources as well. All right, Caitlin. Well, before we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with listeners about the overall topic of regenerating land and natural resources? Yeah. Um, I mean, like I said, I, I, I talk about this being, a, you know, a buzzword and it's just, it's exciting to see that happen though. I don't want anyone to think I'm saying that in a negative light because it's 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 exciting to see this be the po popular trendy thing now because for a long time it was, oh, you know, you're a hippie rancher <laughs> if you're into the, you know, the regenerative <laughs> grazing and things like that. And um, it's really cool to see it, you know, catching momentum like this and becoming something that people are talking about and excited about and um, there's all sorts of networks available of ranchers that are doing this because, I mean, at, at, at the end of the day, it's not just about the soil and the land, right? Regeneration also is regeneration of profits. It's regeneration of families. It's regeneration of the resilience and sustainability of someone's operation. So um, it's, it's regenerating more. It's regenerating communities, regenerating our water quality. It's not just, you know, oh, hey, we want, we want lots of green grass and we want to see the butterflies and you know we want organic matter um because we do want all of those things but i feel like it's a lot more than that and anybody who's you know you know becoming curious and exploring this um i just want you to keep that in mind that it's so much more than even just the ecosystem piece of it um it's 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 community it's social it's socioeconomic it's um profits and so there's, there's more to it than that. And I, I feel like that's part of that mindset shift. Whenever 
you start to see things with a regenerative mindset, you see more than just the grazing land with through that lens. You start seeing everything else through that lens too. So it excites me for the people that are um, that are exploring it. And I want to thank you for having the conversation and for inviting me into it. So I'm excited to see who else you have on this podcast for this series. Yeah, well, it is a great lineup and I appreciate you being a part of the conversation today. This was a very refreshing conversation about the topic and um, yeah, so thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, Shay. It's been fun. Alrighty, folks, that is a wrap on this podcast episode, but just the beginning of so much great information that is going to be shared by our friends at the Noble Research Institute. So with that, remember that if you are curious and you want to learn more, be able to check out the links in my show notes for more information. And with that, stay curious and happy ranching.